been a hot summer for many across the nation, including there in West Virginia. Temperatures in the 90s, hot on the recruiting trail as well. Three commits to talk about in the last week. A lot of player movement to get to on our Mountaineer show. We've done it 25 consecutive weeks. We appreciate you all being here. Bring those comments and questions. Leave them in the live chat. Consider contributing as well. Hit the like button before you get settled. Folks, we got Coos Walker here. So catch him on Coos's Corner. Justin, how you doing today? Doing great, Mark. How are you? I'm doing well. Good to see you. Glad mm -hmm. you're here. And uh, we've got a packed show lined up. So we're going to get to these uh, commitments here. But we're also going to talk a little Texas football. Size that up. Uh, we, we are doing a, an opponents series. So uh, with the Longhorns uh, showing up. Uh, on West Virginia's schedule, of course, we will uh, talk some Texas football, and then a little bit later, we're going to dive into some um, some analytics uh, revolving around West Virginia's football popularity, the fan base size, and some um, items put together by one Tony Altimore. So we will get to Tony a little bit later in the hour. But as it stands right now, Justin, here in the last three to five days, uh, some talent coming into the fold for 2023. Yeah, yeah, we've landed three recruits. Well, I say I shouldn't say landed. We got verbal commits from three recruits this week: uh, an offensive lineman, a defensive lineman, and a running back. All three star, all three star guys. The uh, yeah, uh, yeah, the uh, three the lineman was Cooper Young. The offensive lineman was Cooper Young. And uh, defensive lineman is Iman Smalls, and the running back, his name is Jordan Louie out of Georgia. He actually originally played his high school ball in Alabama, but he's transferred to uh, Georgia. Yeah, see, Cooper Georgia. Young listed as the uh, 74th rated uh, interior offensive lineman guard center in the country out of uh, Pennsylvania. Then mm -hmm. we also have, as I'm trying to scramble and find a few different things at the same time, uh, then we've got uh, Eamon Smalls, uh, yes, a defensive lineman at 6'2", 295, according to 247 Sports. He's ranked at 137 along the defensive front out of uh, South Carolina. Yeah, Jordan cool. Louie is the lowest-rated ranked uh, player in the class right now. I don't see any ratings on him right now, running back out of Georgia. Yeah, he, he wasn't rated by 24-7 or on three, but Rivals has him as a three-star. Um, but he's he's gotten some good offers. He got offers from Arkansas, Louisville, Mark Maryland. So I think he's one of those kids that are kind of flying under the radar a little bit. But he looks like he's talented. He's he can he's got a good stiff arm. He's he's six foot two, two hundred pounds. So he's big for a high school running back, um, which I like. And he's got good breakaway speed, deceiving speed. Actually, doesn't look like he's that fast, but. When he gets in the open field, nobody catches him. So I think he's one of those guys that just runs. He's a smooth runner, so you really can't uh, – he, he's faster than he looks, you know. So once he breaks and gets some space, man, look out. And he's uh, – when he rounds the edge, man, he's hard to tackle. Like I said, that stiff arm he's got is brutal. He'll lay a man on the ground with his stiff arm, which is, which is a good sign. And he hits the hole quick, which is good. Has good vision. All right, uh, Justin, appreciate you being here. Uh, Justin, uh, checking out the three commits that came in over the next uh, week, and we will talk, of course, West Virginia football and all the commits coming in. Of course, June is a crazy good month, interesting month across the nation, all sorts of camps, all sorts of offers, all sorts <clears throat> of uh, individual workouts, uh, unofficial visits, and official visits. June 27th is the start of the dead period, so colleges – um, football programs are racing toward trying to get it as much in as possible over the next few weeks. All right. Uh, and JT Daniels got to speak for the first time in a brief, right. uh, brief event. They had a kid's camp. Uh, he worked and did a quick interview, basically said that uh, West Virginia was dope. It was what he used. <laughs> And uh, or I think he said Morgantown was dope, something like that. But uh, said he was enjoying it. Said he was, you know, he'd been there a month now. So he and he said I've mostly he's been in the building most of the time. So he's gotten to, he's gotten to spend a lot of time around the guys, and uh, he really likes the chemistry. And said he so far he's 
everything seems good. So that's, where I think was, that's uh, where was CT Daniels speaking? He was at, at a kid's camp in Morgantown. They were holding a camp for the part of their NI as part of their NIL agreement. They were doing a camp. Him and some a few other players. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. Well, again, we're going to talk a little Texas football here at uh, some point. We got a guest coming in from uh, Locked On Longhorns, and uh, we will get to that. Uh, in the meantime, let's check out uh, any of your comments and questions coming on down the line. Joey. <laughs> the helmet talk. What's he talking? Oh, they must be talking about helmets in the chat room. Yeah, what do we got here? You're going to upset Mark with the helmet talk. I don't know where that's coming from, but uh, yeah, it must be. Yeah. In the people people like to order me around on the helmet <laughs> display. Hey, it's your helmet. <laughs> We've got about 29 of them, and I can never position them the way that pleases everybody. So that's the way it is. Uh, if Bad. we're looking for a West Virginia helmet to be on display, of course, I would put it prominently in the shot during the uh, West Virginia uh, segments here during our West Virginia show every week. I think I've got uh, enough you know West Virginia. Happen there. Somebody <laughs> needs to I've send got... us a West Virginia helmet. Yeah, I think I've got enough West Virginia stuff to uh, make up for it, Mark. I think you're good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're you're well stocked there. No, no, but, I mean, uh, I mean, if you want one, no, I'm not going to argue with you. But uh, well, yeah, I would love to have a West Virginia helmet. So that's that's up to everybody out there. I uh, like I say, I don't know where the count is. It's about thirty helmets right now, and. Uh, I purchased the first 10. Then after that, I figured, hey, if people want to see helmets, they'll get helmets. So the, the last 20 have been sent in by viewers. So oh, cool. uh, if anybody wants to jump on West Virginia, go right ahead. Yeah, they I, uh, will be featured uh, prominently. Yeah, I'm not ready to do that yet. I'm not. I'm, st I'm still not at a point where I have a. I don't have a PO box yet. And I'm, not, I'm not giving out my home address. So no, 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 no. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing that either. I've got a few people that don't Absolutely like me. Not. <laughs> Yeah, we, we don't want to uh, go there at all. No, 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 no. I, I saw a question I can we can address. Who is going to be WVU's number two quarterback from Gregory Krug? What's up, Gregory? Um, don't really know yet. Uh, Goose Crowder looked the best in the spring game, but all indications were that spring camp, Garrett Green was looking the best. So it's really kind of hard to tell, to be honest with you. Nico looked okay. I mean, he didn't look bad either, but, you know, he's he's young. He's a, he's a freshman, so he's it's likely not going to be him. I uh, actually saw an article about him. He got to spend some time with a reporter during that camp and the reporter did an article about the conversation. And um, Nico seems like a mature young man. He said he uh, said he realized he had a lot to learn when he got there. And JT Daniels is actually doing, you know, doing a lot of teaching to him, so – He's taking advantage of having JT in the quarterback room already. They've already watched some film together, which is a good thing. And uh, Nico just wants to learn. So I think he's going to be the future, but I don't think he's going to be the number two guy this season, is my opinion. But I could be wrong. I think it's still up, up for grabs, I guess, is the best answer. Folks, please uh, subscribe to our West Virginia <laughs> channel here at the Voice of College Football. So we simulcast each Friday night right here on the main channel and then also on the West Virginia channel, trying to build that up uh, to be as strong as possible. So please subscribe there. We've been running a opponent's media series uh, with a few um, of the scheduled opponents for 2022 media members to get a quick preview on those teams. We're going to talk a little Texas tonight. We got Jonathan Davis on the line from Locked on Longhorns with, of course, Texas and WVU getting together on October 1st down in Austin. Jonathan, how are we doing tonight? I'm I'm blessed, man. I'm watching Texas right now in, in the College World Series. But, yeah, we're excited for football, and uh, it's going to be a, a good matchup with West Virginia. I'm excited about what they're doing this year. You know, you talked about JT Daniels and a uh, sneaky good team uh, in Morgantown. So it's going to be interesting. 
So Jonathan, um, you're probably sick of being at the top of all sorts of off season lists each off season about who's the most overrated, who's the most hyped, who's the most disappointing, who's the most this, who's the most that, because Texas has been all of that since 2010. All right. But here we are with a top 15 roster. I think it's pretty comfortable to say this is a top 15 roster in America. Uh, the quarterback position is going to be intriguing. So let me start with, um, and, and Justin and I can alternate in regards to asking you questions to get uh, your look at Texas. I'm going to start at the top, not at the very top, but at the football top with Steve Sarkeesian. People could argue that he didn't necessarily get the job done at USC or at Washington. Now he comes into Texas. I got to admit, I thought there were better, better candidates. Uh, I didn't exactly think that he earned the position, but here he is. He's a great offensive mind. Five and seven last year. I watched a lot of Texas football. I saw them compete for well into the second half against Oklahoma State. Of course, there was the Oklahoma collapse. You can you can mention just about anybody on the schedule, especially through the first five or six games, and say Texas, Texas was right there with them. And you know better than I do if we rewind to halftime of the Oklahoma game. Texas had lost once, but that was out of conference to Arkansas. So here they are undefeated in the conference. They're winning by three touchdowns at halftime against Oklahoma. Had they won that game, they're sitting pretty to be in the driver's seat to get to the Big 12 championship game as, as at least the two seed. And then it all unraveled after that. So give us your first impression of Steve Sarkeesian through one season and a couple off seasons. Yeah, so uh, that was kind of painful to hear <laughs> and rehash that. But um, definitely, you know, uh, my thoughts on Steve Sarkeesian, I think anytime you go five and seven at the University of Texas, it's a disappointment. Um, regardless if it's your first year and you didn't really get to put your imprint on the program. And when you talk about, you know, the six game losing streak, the longest um, in Texas since at the University of Texas since the 50s, I think you have to look at his first season as a disappointment. Now, I do think that Sark is the right coach for this program. And I think that he's brought new energy to this program with all of the new players that he brought in this offseason. He came out and said that he was going to bring in 30 new football players. And he didn't lie. He brought in 30 plus new football players. And a lot of the ones that he brought in are really good, whether that be the ones from the 2022 recruiting class or bringing in one of the top transfer classes in the nation headlined by Quinn Ewers. So I think you have to look at last year as a disappointment, but I do not look at it as an indictment on Sark necessarily, or I don't look at it as a reason to doubt Sark moving forward. I do think he is the right coach for this football program. I think that he has brought a lot more talent. I think that I don't think that they were a five win team last year. I think that was an eight win team. You talked about how they had leads going into the fourth quarter on the three best teams in the Big 12 last year, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State and Baylor, and then ended up losing all of those games. So I think it was an eight or nine win team that ended up winning five games. Now, I think there's a lot more talent on the roster this year than there was last year. And I also think this is the year that the win total actually matches the talent on the roster. I'm not saying Texas is back but I think they're on the road there at least, hopefully. Uh, I got a question for you. And this is, I've been, I've been wanting to ask this of a Texas fan for a while now. Uh, welcome to the show, by the way, Jonathan. Appreciate you for having uh, me. Um, all the talk has been about their offense, about Quinn Ewers, Xavier, you know, Xavier Worthy, Bijan, obviously. But we all know Texas's issues last year were mainly on the defensive side of the ball. What have they done to address their, their defensive struggles? Yeah, so I think one big thing is is bringing in uh, Gary Patterson, who y'all are familiar with, you know, uh, former TCU head coach. Bringing him in as a special assistant to Sark, I think that's a really good get. We know that Gary Patterson could go a lot of places in the country and be a head coach, and he decided to come down to the 40 acres and, and help out Pete Kukowski with that defense. And so um, I think that's one thing. I think another thing is they've been experimenting with some different looks up front. I won't give West Virginia too much. I don't know who's watching. Maybe, you know, the offensive coordinator or something. But they've been experimenting with some different looks up front. Um, and I think that's going to allow them to be better in the run game than they were last year. Also, um, allow them to get to the quarterback at a more proficient rate than they did last mm -hmm. year. Only 20 sacks um, on the season, which is horrible. And then we talked so much about – well, people have talked so much about this 2022 recruiting class. And they talk about the seven offensive linemen that they brought in. But this is a class where they brought in eight defensive linemen. They brought in more defensive linemen than they brought in offensive linemen. It doesn't get talked about enough. And so I think that there was a lot of 
players in that class that, you know, maybe not going to be the best players on the team or anything like that, but can come in and make an impact this year. Um, I do think that not getting Oshawn Mathis in the transfer portal like they thought they would was a big loss. Um, this is a team that I, I mentioned the, you know, ineptitude in the pass rush last year. I still don't think that's going to be a strength for this football team. And I think they were hoping that Oshawn Mathis could come in and be the best pass rusher for this team. So I think there's still a hole um, on that pass rush, but um, they brought in Ryan Watts in the transfer portal. I think that gave them an experienced corner um, at a top program out of Ohio State. I think he's going to start. Um, I think they brought in two really good corners um, that's going to beef up that defensive backfield in this recruiting class. They also moved two players to safety to the safety position. So um, there may be a work in progress, but I think they're two really talented players who should excel at that position as the year goes on. And so um, I think bringing in some different coaches, uh, bringing in some really talented players via the transfer portal, um and the recruiting class and when you look at it this is the first time in four years that texas will be in the same defensive system two years in a row they had three straight different defensive coordinators this is the first time in four years that they're going to have the same defense two years in a row so just based off of consistency and familiarity mm -hmm. the defense will be better okay hey jonathan while we're staying with the roster talk let's uh, go back to the offense and the offensive line probably the worst unit would you agree with me in the last three to five years on the team I definitely would agree with that. Okay. Uh, so part of that's recruiting. And again, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the recruiting on the offensive line has been okay, but it's not been up to the uh, the standards of the other units. And then I think it's been more development, <clears throat> lack of development across the offensive line. So what gives you hope that that's going to change? Yeah. So I think when you look at the class that they brought in, I mean, you're right, you know, it's development and um, it's not just about bringing in talent. I don't think Texas has ever really struggled to bring in talent, um, although I think they've brought in more talent over the last year than they have in a few years, especially towards the end of the Tom Herman era. Um, I talked about this on Locked on Longhorns the other day. I think the reason that it's going to be different is because when you look at the caliber of the class that they brought in offensive line wise I, and just thought talent around them that they have on offense, I think that the offensive line is going to be a lot better. Um, what I looked at is when you bring in a historic offensive line class like the one that they did, my simple premise is that the best players in high school turn out to be the best players in college and the best players in college ultimately go on to be the best players in the NFL, right? So when we look at Devin Campbell, he was the ninth overall recruit in the country at guard. I think that he can come in and start, probably will come in and start right away at left guard. I did some research and according to 24 sevens uh, recruiting rankings, from 2010 to 2019, every number one overall offensive line recruit made it to the NFL level. The 2020 top offensive line recruit, Paris Johnson Jr. at Ohio State, he is a projected first round pick in next year's draft. So what that tells me is that 24-7 usually gets it right. And the top offensive line recruit in each class, a decade's worth of data, tells me is an NFL player. Devin Campbell was the number one offensive line recruit in this class. And so that tells me that he has at least NFL talent based off of a decade's worth of data. Kelvin Banks, the number 32 overall recruit in the country, the number one offensive tackle, he's coming in. I think he can slot right in as your left tackle. Um, Sark said that his staff believes that he could be a future top five pick at the left tackle position. You look at Cole Hudson, who was the one out of the seven who enrolled early. He's been on campus since January. So although he'll be a true freshman, he worked his way up to first team reps in the spring, had a really good spring, and he's kind of getting that head start, being able to enroll early. So, Yes, he'll still be getting his first game experience in September, but he's a true freshman that's been on campus for eight months. And so the reason I think the offensive line will be better um, is because I think that they're adding NFL type talent to this offensive line. I know they're not NFL players right now, but I believe in three or four years we'll be looking at Kelvin Banks and Devin Campbell as NFL players. And that's why I think that this offensive line will be better. And, you know, we bring on uh, John Garcia, director of football recruiting from Sports Illustrated. And I talked to him about this. And the one thing that he said is, you know, in college football, you don't want to rely on freshmen if you don't have to. But every year there are true freshmen that come in and show that they belong in college football. And I think that's what you're going to see from Devin Campbell and Kelvin Banks at least. And that's why I have faith that this offensive line will be better. A lot of, there's been, Jonathan, there's been a lot of talk around the culture issues at Texas. Do you feel like that's getting fixed? I think it is. Um, I, I think you saw when when Moro Ojimo came out uh, about those comments and talked about, uh, you know, the Texas football program and, and maybe having, you know, more me players over we players. And, and I definitely think that happens when you have the brand 
uh, that you have at Texas, but you're not winning. You know, you 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 get all of the benefits of being a Texas football player, um, even if you're not putting in the work and dominating on the field. You know, Texas mm-hmm. is going to be one of the most talked about teams, whether they win five games or, or, or 12 games. And, you know, I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. I see the same things with, you know, the Dallas Cowboys sometimes where sometimes it seems like the glitz and glamour is prioritized over the product on the field. Um, and, and when you're losing, I, I think that happens. You know what I'm saying? You talked about it from the top to the bottom, like, I think when you're losing, that just trickles down and, and affects everything. I think that there's a different energy around this program. I mentioned that earlier. And and I think that people are starting to look at this program differently. Of course, coming from a Texas fan, like saying that to people that aren't Texas fans, it's like, OK, we've been hearing this for a decade. Right. But I like I said, because I've been around this program, I, I, I think that there's something different. I think there's a different energy. I think that there's a different talent level. You talked about, you know, bringing in Quinn Ewers, the highest graded quarterback coming out of high school since Vince Young. I mean, you know, that's. You know, we can talk about, you know, Hudson Card is talented. Casey Thompson is talented. Quinn Ewers is on another level of talent, right? And then now, you know, it seems as though Texas is one of the top three schools for Arch Manning. That's a different level of talent. And so I think that um, some of the coordinators they've brought in have brought a different energy to this program. I think Sark has brought a different energy to this program. I think people around college football are noticing that. I think recruits are noticing that. I think people in the transfer portal are noticing that. And that's why I think Texas is headed in the right direction because I think people see that Sark has brought a different energy to this program that just simply wasn't there uh, with Tom Herman and, and Charlie Strong for most of his tenure as well. Got uh, Jonathan Davis on the line. You can catch his work and everybody else there that contributes at uh, Locked On Longhorns. So please check him out right there. Uh, Jonathan, you brought up the quarterback battle. So Quinn Ewers, for, for not throwing a pass in college football yet, has gained a whole lot of attention. An NIL deal, uh, an early commit. Uh, to Texas, I believe, before Ohio State, correct? And then he flipped yeah, to Ohio State. Commit, yeah, committed to Texas first, decommitted, went to Ohio State, and then transferred yeah. back to Texas. Was yep. supposed to be playing high school football last year, decided at the last minute, hey, NIL goes to the Buckeyes. Of course, he was way too late for the quarterback battle there. They had a pretty good one in C.J. Stroud, transfers back. Now he's lined up against a guy in Hudson Card that, of course, won the job initially out of camp last year had a poor game to a certain extent, offensive line issues as well. Game number two against Arkansas, Casey Thompson generally won the job and, and played most of the way down the stretch. So compare these guys, and are you going to be surprised if Ewers doesn't win it? Yeah, I'm definitely going to be surprised if Ewers doesn't win it. I think you can start at the base premise that, you know, you don't bring in a high profile quarterback like that to sit on the bench. Um, but I think even outside of that, I think when Ewers just elevates the ceiling of your football team, I think that, Hudson Card is a good football player. I think he's really athletic, fast, definitely more mobile um, than Quinn Ewers, although I think Quinn Ewers has more of a presence in the pocket as far as being able to move around in the pocket to make throws and make plays. Hudson Card is more of the dual threat mobile athlete, and he's still a really good quarterback himself. But at the University of Texas, there's a different standard. I think Hudson Card can start for a lot of programs in college football. We talked, but I talked about it as in Quinn Ewers, you know, being the highest graded quarterback since Vince Young, that's a five star plus plus a type of prospect. And I, I think that he's just uh, he's special. You know, if Hudson Carter is good, Quinn Ewers is special. And you talked about, you know, all of the hype for somebody who hasn't taken a snap. I mean, he's top five in, in the Heisman. You know, uh, it's, you know he, has, he hasn't even been named the starter yet. But I think that he's just special. I mean, you see the the live arm. That's obviously the first thing that. Um, you know, jumps off the screen to you, just a live arm, the ability to make um, any type of throw. He's a gunslinger and he's young. So I think that um, he is going to make some mistakes at time. Anytime you see a quarterback like that, that has such a live arm um, and they believe that they can make every throw, they're going to get themselves into trouble at times. And I think that we saw that earlier in the spring. Um, but as he continued to get more comfortable, as he continued, uh, you know, to, really dive into the playbook, you know, because he's in a new system the first time at Texas, you know, learning Sark, learning what he wants to do. I think that you started to see him be more comfortable. And I think it was April 9th. It was that first full scrimmage in the spring where he came out and every report was that he was the MVP. Um, I think he had like three or four touchdown passes and a rushing touchdown. A couple of them hit the Texas football Twitter. Um, One was a beautiful, you know, kind of moving around in the pocket on the run strike 50 yard touchdown to Xavier Worthy in the spring. Another one was an RPO touchdown to Jordan Whittington had touchdowns to, you know, new transfer tight end out of Alabama, Jaleel Billingsley, five-star prospect behind him, JT Sanders. That was just when he really started to put it together on April 9th that he continued to dominate throughout the rest of the spring. And so I think that he's really putting it together. And when you talk about, 
you know, competing at the level that Texas wants to compete at, you need a superstar at quarterback, not a good quarterback. And like I said, Hudson Carter is a good quarterback. But when you look at the top programs in college football, they have difference makers at the quarterback position. Bryce Young is a difference maker. C.J. Stroud is a difference maker. And I think Quinn Ewers is a difference maker. And that's why he needs to start over Hudson Card. I have two things. One, will can somebody please get Quinn Ewers to shave his mullet? Cut his mullet. It's hard to respect he, anybody that wears a mullet. He so so they asked him about it and he was like, it's just hair, man. You know, he's just Joe Cool. I um, think it's the I think it's the coolest thing ever. You know what I mean? It's unique, right? Like it's like you're gonna know it's Quinn Ewers because of the mullet. So yeah, I mean the, the fact that an 18-year-old kid wants to walk around with a mullet, I think that's cool, you know. <laughs> that's different. <laughs> and uh, number two, and this don't don't kill me for saying this, Jonathan, but uh I've heard it all, man. Go is ahead. horns down really that big of a deal to Texas fans? It is. It is. And it, and I think it's crazy. And it's funny because, you know, it's like now it's like a running joke because they've like put down sanctions on people doing the horns yeah. down and stuff. So it's like now they look at us like super sensitive and I'm like, do what you want. Because to me, like all of it determines is determined by play on the field or whatever sport it is, play on the court, you know, whatever. Like when – Texas was playing ECU in, in the regional and ECU was throwing the horns down. It's like, okay, you got to eat that now that Texas is in the college world series. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, in Omaha and you're at home. So uh, I think fans make way too much of it. I also think that, um, you know, I mean, you can look at it, it both sides, you know, the Texas fans, you know, they're repping their team and they're like, Oh, we're rent free in everybody's heads. Why does everybody want to throw the horns down? Why does mm -hmm. all of this whoopty woo? But at the end of the day, you know, Texas is one of the most hated teams in the country, you know, and, and people are going to throw the horns down. And at the end of the day, the one way to prevent people from throwing the horns down is to go out there and have success on the field, the court or whatever domain, uh, you know, you're playing in that athletic program. And so um, I don't it's not a big deal to me. You could throw down the horns down all you want, you know, because at the end of the day, like I said, if we go out there and win, what does it really mean? But Texas fans definitely get sensitive about it. They definitely uh, it disturbs them, you know, and, and like I said, I'm not sure why it's a hand gesture, but. You know, fan is short for fanatic, so I guess I that's you. why. I got Jonathan, I got uh, two more items for you as well. So mm -hmm. the first one would be there are all sorts of uh, college football teams we could cite and say, <laughs> okay, they they developed a culture problem, and somebody was able to go in there and fix it, or somebody was able to go in there and they failed in trying to fix it. Texas is the only program that every time there's a coaching change, every time there's a proposed coaching change, and I've been Unfortunately, I can age myself and talk about Fred Akers. You know, I can go back forever and, and talk about this program. Texas is the only program that when it's talked about culture, it's beyond the football program. It's talking about politics and the university and the boosters and the boosters get involved everywhere. But it's more of this just hierarchy within the state of Texas that goes beyond the, the, the clubhouse behind the, beyond the locker room that I think, man, whoever takes over this program and attempts to fix it from a culture standpoint has to even go beyond just fixing the heads of 18 and 21 year olds. He's got to lay down the law beyond the locker room. Yeah, no, I, I think, definitely think that's a good point. And, you know, now when we're in this new era of college football with NIL, I think that's even more important, right? Because I think the boosters kind of have a little bit more power, you know, than ever really now um, when they, you know, right or wrong, you know, are, are probably talking to these uh, high school recruits in some form or fashion and these people in the transfer portal in some form or fashion. So um, I think you're definitely like, definitely right when you're at a program um, like Texas that has the history that it has. It has the hype around it each year. It has so many people involved with it. It has so many people, you know, with their hands on the program. Um, you know, I, I think that makes it a little bit tougher uh, for, you know, a coach at the University of Texas, maybe than some other schools that don't have the allure or the history or the brand uh, that the University of Texas has. But as I mentioned before, I, I, I like what Sark has done this offseason. I think Sark I can't say quietly because it's the University of Texas, but I think Sark has had one of the best off seasons of any coach in college football. But, you know, we've seen Texas dominate the spring before. You know, it's what really remains to be seen is if they can dominate in the fall. But I think Sark is the right person at the head, um, you know, at the head position. And so we'll see if it translates on the field this year. I think this is the year for Texas. You know, maybe this is one of the, you know, maybe I'm answering a question that's going to come. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think this is the year for Texas. This is a, a year where, uh, the Big 12 is wide open. Um, you know, our partners bet online had four teams 
um, at the over under at eight and a half wins. Um, and they had Oklahoma favored, but you know, they had Texas right behind them, you know, and Oklahoma state and Baylor had some pretty favorable odds as well. So the big 12 is wide open. Um, you talked about Texas having probably inarguably a top 15 roster, and this is the year that they need to uh, put that to fruition and go out and compete for a big 12 championship. I am no expert on over-unders. I produced my first over-unders video at the start of last season. I'm more of a week-to-week -week guy, but I did go 5-2 and two, my first shot at it. And you're not going to want to watch my over-under on Texas, Jonathan. I'll just say that. So anyway, okay. <laughs> um, that, that, this is my part. And nothing against Texas. I just um, I just kind of hey, signed your, it's, up. It's, it's your money, man. Hey, once you, once you put your money down, it's just, yeah, it's not about it's not about my feelings. You know what I'm saying? It's about making sure that you cash out on your return. So if you don't think Texas yeah. is going to win, you know, nine games, I feel you, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And as you well know, hey. You get some right, you get some wrong. So it's no guarantee by go. any stretch. No, there you go. no way. Uh, so this is my parting shot in regards to what I want to hear out of you is obviously the future is all about the SEC. So when that came down, I'm sure you heard a zillion different things from a zillion different people on message boards and, and uh, the, the people that uh, your viewers and so forth and so on, because Texas fans could take this one on one two ways obviously like uh-oh we better <laughs> we can't be who we've been you know take away 2018 in a few rare moments uh we can't be who we've been for the last 10 or 12 years because now we're really going to get punched in the mouth or you know what we're texas we got all the resources all the facility everything to make this happen and maybe this is what we need as a slap in the face like time to step up and get it done so your thoughts about joining the SEC? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit closer to the second one. Um, I think the first one is more, you know, uh, non-Texas fans. Um, and, you know, they talk about, you know, you can't even beat Kansas. What are you going to do in the SEC? You know, and all of that. And I mean, coming off of a five and seven season, that's justified. But I think when you look at Texas um, and you talked about 2018, you know, I, I think recently they've showed even when they played against outside of the Arkansas game, um, you know, they beat Georgia in the Sugar Bowl last time they played. Obviously, that probably wasn't the Georgia team that they were last year, um, you know, but still a really good Georgia team at that time. If we talk about that Joe Burrow LSU team is the best college football of all time, Texas was in that game to the very end. So I think that when they've played teams in the SEC, even though Texas hasn't been Texas outside of the Arkansas game, they still fared really well. And I think that Texas fans are excited. They feel like we can go into the SEC. Um, it'll boost our recruitment, even though when you're coming off of, you know, top five recruiting classes, you know, that's not something they struggle in, but it will help. Obviously, you have the potential. I'm not sure how much they want it, but you have the potential to renew the rivalry with Texas A&M, you know, <laughs> and some people would argue that A&M is a bigger rival to Texas than Oklahoma. You know, I Depends on, you know, what you're looking at. But um, I think that Texas fans are really excited about moving to the SEC. And, and I think when you look at it, you know, playing schools like, you know, West Virginia and, and Baylor and, and all of that or, you know, they're no scrubs at all. But when you look at the potential matchups you can have in the SEC where you could go out there on a weekly basis and, you know, play maybe a, a A&M or a, a Arkansas or Oklahoma or a LSU or Florida or Georgia or Alabama. Um, yeah, that's more competition. But I think also it just sets up better for the Texas fan and for the program that you're on those more high key matchups every week. You know, and we know that the SEC is the class of college football. And, you know, I feel like Texas and Oklahoma are the class of the Big 12, you know, maybe overall, you know, not necessarily Oklahoma, maybe in football, Texas not. But I think just overall, those two schools are the class of the Big 12. And, um, you know, like I said, SEC is the, the class of football. And so I think I made perfect sense to moving over there. And, um, you know, I think it's going to be interesting. I think that Texas has the pedigree and the allure to be one of the biggest schools in the SEC. But I think there's enough big schools in the SEC that if Texas goes down there and, you know, doesn't win and, and struggles, I think that, you know, people can look at Texas and, and I think John Garcia, he made a really good point where like Missouri was dominating in the big 12 and then they went to the sec and just became kind of obsolete, like another team in the big 12. I think that there's so many great championship type contending teams in the sec that if Texas goes down there and doesn't win, they could, you know, run the risk of just becoming another team in the sec. And so um, to your first point, I think that that kind of does put a fire under them because they know that being in the sec isn't good enough. They need to be competitive one to validate that move, but two to get their return on investment for joining a conference like the sec. I'm a stickler for accuracy, Jonathan. Missouri was dominating in the S in the uh, big 12. 
Oh, okay. I shouldn't I shouldn't have said dominating, but they they were having some really good seasons. You're right. I, I shouldn't have said that. They were having some really good seasons. They haven't been able to match the level that they built that program up to Absolutely. before they went to the SEC since they've been in the SEC. So Absolutely. Th- thank you. Thank you. Because, you know, we're in this era where we'll, we'll, <laughs> people will listen to the 20 minutes I've been on here and take that one quote and say, John yes. is the dumbest podcast host in the world. Yes, so they thank, will. <laughs> thank you for giving me the opportunity to redeem myself, right? Okay. Yeah, they were, they were a really good team in the Big 12, and they have not lived up to that. So they went to the SEC and they're thus far they've been obsolete since they've been in the sec we all miss speak we all miss speak and i'm right there with you i do it all the time when you talk for five and six hours a day you're going to say something that you didn't exactly totally mean uh before we let you go jonathan i just want to extend and emphasize on one point you made about recruiting that i think is extremely important because i think most of us take the recruiting rankings and we think the difference between one and two is the same as two and three and three and four and so the difference between one and five is the same as five and ten and ten and fifteen and that's not the case if you look at the star ratings and the average player rating we've seen where texas a&m was basically and i won't make a whole lot of friends with texas a&m fans right now but they have a huge rabid fan base they love their football and all that but they were irrelevant and they largely still are until they prove it on the field, irre- irrelevant nationally. But then they joined the SEC and suddenly they became this kind of powerful program that everybody looks at as a power when, again, they haven't proven it on the field, but everybody looks at Texas A&M. And that's largely because they put the SEC patch on their sleeve and said, now we can go recruit with anyone. Well, Texas can already do that. But the difference between... For example, the difference between the, I looked at it today, the difference between the top rated recruiting class this past season and number eight, which was Oklahoma, is the same difference as between Oklahoma at eight and Boston College at 40. So once you get past like Georgia, Ohio State, Alabama, they're usually right there. Then it's a couple others that it, it drops considerably. And Texas has been extremely good right on the fringe of the elite, but maybe some of these classes that are seventh and eighth, and they're really good classes, but there's still a gap there. If they can go to turn that SEC affiliation to we're recruiting top three, top four, just a few notches, that can make all the difference in the world. No, I think you made a really good point about that. Like you said, I mean, the, the, the difference between the top five, I mean, that first of all, that's really good research. Shout out to you. But like you said, the, the difference between one and eight was the same difference between eight and 40. And when def, especially when you get into that top five, um, like you said, I, I remember there was a, a chance last year, you know, after Devin Campbell committed that Texas might have been able to move up to four. That definitely is um, a big deal, you know. And so I think that um, regardless of what Texas does, I think they'll always, you know, be able to recruit in the top 10. I don't think that's hard for Texas. But you talked about the importance of being able to stay in that top five and possibly even move up into the top three. And for Texas to be able to do that, even in the SEC, (laughs) with the brand that they have, the allure that they have and the resources they have, they're going to have to go down there and be competitive and win. Because at the end of the day, you know, NIO may change it a bit. You know, NIO opportunities may lead, you know, players to go where they can get the most money. But at the end of the day, at the core, these players work too hard to not want to win, you know, and, and if they're looking at Texas and the SEC and they're saying, well, I can go to Georgia and win more. I can go to Alabama and win more. I can go to insert school here and win more. That's what they're going to do. So to, for Texas to jump up in that top, you know, three and be one of the best recruiting, recruiting schools in the country. And like I said, really benefit from having the backing of being in the best conference in college football. They're going to have to go down there and hold their own. And that remains to be seen if they'll be able to do that. Jonathan, we appreciate the, um, uh... The information, the insight, the knowledge, breaking it down for us. Appreciate you being here. Would love to have you back. No problem. Anytime, just let me know. And you can find me on YouTube at Locked On Longhorns. Subscribe to the channel. You can also find me on Twitter, Locked On Horns, Locked On Longhorns, available wherever you get your podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You have a great weekend, Jonathan. It was great to have you. Thank you all. Hook them. Yeah. Jonathan Davis with a good rundown on Texas football. We got Coos Walker here. Check out Coos's Corner right here on YouTube as well. He's breaking down some great um, analysis of college football on a regular basis as well, as is another guy that we're bringing in right now. Tony Altamore is a consultant strategist that uh, I became familiar with just here in the last week. How about you, Justin? Uh, You've interacted with Tony as well, correct? I actually have. He and I have done a video together uh, 
I don't know, a week ago, maybe something like that. And uh, and I've seen him on some other on some other college football shows as well. So uh, I really, really like his work. He he man, he puts together some great great stats and, and numbers. Yeah, we had a conversation the other night where Tony joined in, and we could have been there for eight or ten hours bending Tony's ear on all of his research and analysis. It's great stuff, Tony. We appreciate you being here. Thanks for Thanks, stopping guys. by. Thanks, guys. It's good to be here. Tony, I'm going to set us up with some of these uh, graphics here as we get into this. Uh, let's start with the Big 12 and the analysis in regards to fan base sizes. And let's start with the foundation of that and what you pulled together in regards to metrics and analysis to deliver the numbers on the largest to smallest fan bases in the Big 12. Sure. So just before anybody panics, and, and by the way, my apologies to the Oklahoma people. There's a, a wonderful chart of the top 16. You were 17. Oklahoma Twitter has made me learn that you will never be left out. <laughs> if I could do it again, I would change the chart to make it uh, the top 17. I, I apologize <laughs> to the good people of Oklahoma who are quite upset about not being in it. Um, one of the things that I wondered about was I've, I've done a lot of different analysis on some TV things and some other things and really trying to get a sense of how fan bases are distributed. And that's kind of a hard term to actually quantify. Um, but we took a stab. And so, um, what I did is I compiled together, uh, the three best studies that I think have been done. And, and, and by the way, if I had a million dollar uh, research budget and the good people at Gallup, we could get some really amazing stuff. But um, working with what is out there in the public sphere, you know, it's not ESPN marketing internals or something. Um, we took three different studies that were all, each a little different, which I kind of liked, um, and took them, normalized them against population data, um, you know, taking fan base, like, you know, preferences and distributions down to um, like, top six teams per zip code and stuff like that. Um, did that kind of extrapolated, normalized, and then averaged three different sets of data together um, along with a couple, like I said, of you know, some population adjustments and things like that, uh, along with uh, intensity. So, you know, for example, more, and there, and there are good studies on this and good easy data on this, you know, more people in Alabama watch football than in New York City. But there's a lot of people in New York City. And so uh, when you put all that together, and, and I think we, we got to some pretty good data. I, I reviewed it with some actual, like, you know, full-time uh, professional statisticians and stuff to make sure we were doing it the right way. Um, and they were all excited and said, yeah, you know, this is as good as you can get, again, without, you know, the super, like, Gallup type resources. Um, and, and it's pretty good. The one thing I would say is we should consider it relative. Um, so when you look at it, if you want to argue, I think we have twice as many fans. Okay. Maybe you do, but by whatever definition you're using, the other people have that many more as well. Um, you know, similarly, uh, going the other way as well, you know, a couple of things that surprise people, you know, certainly to tell someone in Alabama that, you know, that there are, that another institution has more fans than they do. I, sorry, they do. Um, you know, one of the interesting takeaways, by the way, is, and, and this isn't in there, but we, I've done a study on TV stuff as well. I'm actually was hoping to get more validated today with some people at Viacom, but, um, remember that TV viewing is not a predictor of fans. Um, for example, I watch a lot of <laughs> games that I am not at all a fan of. So if you, you know, these, some, you know, crazy people on the internet are, you know, tweeting at me with, oh, so-and-so has this many million TV people. TV viewing is a measure of how many people watch TV, not a measure of fan base. So anyway, hey, that's kind of how we put together. Yeah, Tony, as we look at this uh, first chart here, and I hope uh, I'll check out the feedback that we're receiving in the live chat to make sure that everyone can see this. I don't know that uh, I can do anything more to expand it, but uh, let's, uh, in the live chat, let us know. Uh, if you're able to check this out. So this is what Tony was alluding to uh, at first in regards to the 16 largest college football fan bases. And just to reiterate, because you know, Tony, things have to be repeated for it to sink in and for people, everyone to catch it. West Virginia would be the next one on this list, correct? At number 17. No, no, uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma at 17. Yeah, West, West Virginia was 30. 30. 30. Real good. Okay. Oklahoma at 17, West Virginia at 30. 
Uh, that Ohio State number <clears throat> is pretty crazy when you look at the percentages of the of the total of the total over number two Notre Dame. So that comes to to my attention, and then also. The one, and I told you this the other night, that surprised me was Syracuse mm -hmm. at yep. number 14. And I've done some more digging on that. And I can, I can answer probably both of those. Um, Ohio State, so the, the three main points of data collection are from 2011, 2014, and 2019, some times that were very, very favorable for Ohio State. So, you know, the Ohio State, in fact, I was just, I just was getting some smack talking texted to me from a good friend from Michigan who was re reading it over. Um, but, you know, those were certainly times when Ohio State was at, you know, certainly it's high, it's highest, but Ohio State, Ohio is a big state and Ohio has a national fan base. And so, uh, you know, if you actually, when you look at like USC at like their height, at, you know, sort of like looking back, at like just the 2011 numbers, when you extrapolate, if I was just to use the 2011 percentages or something, you know, USC would be off the chart. Um, <laughs> USC in 2019, you know, took it way down. Um, and, and so you, you do get a little effect of that. And so you know, there, is, there is an element of, by using the three different periods, we tried to average it in. The thing about the Northeast is there's 60, so for example, there's like three or three and a half or something million people in Oklahoma and three or three and a half million people or something in Alabama. There are 60 million people in the Northeast whose only teams in the region are Syracuse, BC, Army, and Rutgers. And I guess UConn too, that they have, they have a little bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they do have a, de a decent fan base in Connecticut. And so the thing about Syracuse is, again, you're talking about fan base. So I have a lot of friends who are devout USC fans who barely remember that they play football on Saturdays. And so, you know, if you're tracking metrics or something like that, yeah, they're going to, oh, UCLA, UCLA is even worse. Um, you know, they're going to consider themselves big fans, but they don't necessarily watch the game. Now, nobody who's watching our live chat, like, knows that people like this exist to be totally honest uh, <laughs> because we don't we don't like to be around those people we like to be around people that absolutely know what game is going on and so with, with syracuse for example you have a lot of people that and this is what it would look like it looks like you know would consider themselves syracuse fans they stink uh they have a huge basketball following which sustains you know overall the brand i think and i think that that pushes it up as well uh, but the interesting thing about Syracuse is if you go back in history to when they were the national champions, um, they actually didn't have more fans, more uh, people in the seats than they do now. Because Syracuse is really far from the city. It's really cold. And, you know, not as many people actually go to the games. And, the tr and again, they didn't when they were the national champions either. We're talking uh, about 1959, correct? Syracuse right, national right champion? Right around then. Late 50s, early 60s. Yeah. And... Uh... Those people they, had to sit out in the cold, though. They, they, they did, in the they carrier they dome, dome now, at least. They didn't have a dome. <laughs> but, yeah, but I mean, when you think about when you think about the fan base, I mean, I, I, of course, you also have issues with getting there. Um, I, went to, I went to the USC Syracuse game in 2011 or something. I think it was 2012 in the Meadowlands. And you had all these hysterically, like, drunk USC people walking out being like, what's a Secaucus looking for the train station? So, you know, Syracuse has transport issues that other people don't. But, you know, again, there's 60 million people and like four teams versus Alabama has three and a half million people and three teams. So when I was at ESPN, then I'll let Justin, uh, I'm sorry, Justin, if I'm going to hog this off the beginning, but certainly I'll cut you loose after this. Um, when I was at ESPN, we would do all sorts of fan studies that I had no direct interaction in. That was not my department, but we would. And they probably have better data. internals than I do. What well, pardon me? I said they probably have great internal data. We we would have phenomenal data, and I could look at that stuff all day. And um, they would categorize fans um, in terms of their their usage, their their amount of game viewership to say these people are fringe fans, these people are moderate fans, these people are insane fans, and they may have had more categories than that to get a yeah. real look at okay the the level of fan absolutely segmentation is key i i did some stuff kind of taking a look at that data like taking a look and saying okay well this particular study is kind of measuring people in this way the 2019 data is actually based off like years of ticket sales so that actually i thought you know that that's your more serious fan and the 2014 study i think is based off facebook 
And so I was like, okay, well, that kind of gives you a measure of your, your lighter fan. Um, and, and, and I thought because I didn't have, you know, that good kind of like ESPN or Gallup internal stuff, um, I thought probably the best thing to do would be to average them together and kind of consider it a, a relative comparison so that you're, you know, rather than necessarily say, okay, Ohio State is at 11 million, you, you say, okay, Ohio State's about 11 million. It's about X percent more than Notre Dame. And, I, and, and now what you might see, for example, you might see more when you have that great ESPN data, you probably have something more where, again, you know, if, if I had the resources of, you know, good polar, good polling people and everything, be awesome. But what you can probably do is dig into that and say, all right, um, you know, out, God knows Oklahoma has more devout fans. Um, you know, Oregon has more insane people on Twitter. Um, USC has more, um, you know, delightfully happy, don't really care that much half fans. Um, again, picking on, I, I, by the way, I only pick on schools that I love. <laughs> I was uh, shocked to see Wisconsin in the middle of that list, honestly. Uh, and, well, so grow, having grown up in Big Ten country, Wisconsin, Wisconsin people, they all love the Badgers. Um, yeah. And yeah. there's you know lots of Wisconsin people in Chicago, too. Right. Well, I guess it's one of those deals where almost everybody in the state likes that team, kind of like West Virginia, but they have a lot more people than we do. Exactly. Uh, they, yeah. they re, you know, really, I, I, I guess they have a little more people than you guys do. Uh, I'd have to look at the numbers, but yeah. Plus, you had the Chicago in, though. The Chicago factor in, too, though. Yeah, yeah. and you're right. Exactly. Because they're just, just right down the way. But yeah, they, Wisconsin, actually, Wisconsin and West Virginia fans are probably pretty good comparables, you know, <laughs> both in great college towns um, yeah. with, with devout fans who love it. Um, you know, they have jump around, you guys have country roads. What more do you need? Right. <laughs> And Oregon, you know, I was surprised. I, not not a surprise to see Oregon on the list as I am to see them, see them that close to the top. So I'll tell you what I think with Oregon. So when I look at the maps that they put together, um, both of the both of the studies that that were uh, geolocation based. The thing about Oregon, one, one Oregon has thanks to Nike, brilliant branding. Their mm -hmm. marketing and branding, nobody beats nobody. Right. Um, but Oregon has really crept as as UW has just stunk. Mm -hmm. um, Oregon has horrifyingly do not, you know, tell my Washington friends this um, Oregon fans have crept up north of the border. And as Cal and Stanford have stunk, um, I mean, when you look at the maps, the, the Oregon section covers a good chunk of Northern California. So right. they are and into Idaho. So like, you know, other than Boise State, you know, Oregon is starting to own the, the whole Northwest. Hey, Tony, I'm going to put two numbers together and you tell me if there is connection there or they're completely exclusive to one another. Yeah. So Ohio State apparently is the largest fan base in America. And and whether people doubt whether that date is accurate, it's it's got to be somewhat accurate. We, exactly. we know we know that it's close. I was, um, I will, I hold on, actually, real quick, Mark, just for sure. everybody listening, let me tell you the one area that 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 is that may be a little screwy with the data. And that is like the um, the Sun Belt, for example, yep. um, have a lot of teams in some areas where there's a ton of schools. So like North Carolina, you know, the Dallas area, um, the New York Times data only gives six teams per zip code. And so we did some things to try to account. I won't you know, bore you with the statistical back end. We did some things to try to account for, you know, what is what is within the rest. But uh, and, and we did some things to take those numbers and then. Uh, take the missing part and sort of allocate it proportionally uh, with some estimation, but and it, it, that's a really small fringe piece. But to conferences like the Sun Belt, um, we hypothesize that it probably is most of their, it, you know, a lot of it would be to their people. You know that that the seventh team in, in in Michigan where I grew up, you know, the seventh team is 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 zero percent. It might be Oregon, whatever. Um, yep. But in Dallas, the seventh team might be might be Texas State, and, and that adds up for them so, so take, I again, little, take everybody as relative most important sure. i become a little detached from the the tv ratings since i left my last job but I, I still love tv ratings and i'm still intrigued by them but i used to see data every day and the big 10 and the sec populate almost every game of the top 10 or 15 games watched every year 
And in the Big Ten, obviously, that's almost always Ohio State games. Uh, the other thing that comes into this is that if you look at the markets that watch college football the most, they're obviously not New York and Los Angeles and Chicago. They're they're just Birmingham and yes, like exactly. That. They're just locked into the South, Alabama, Knoxville, Tennessee, those places. And then it jumps to Columbus, Cincinnati. It's centered around Ohio State football. Um, and this is a West Virginia show. As soon as I get done with this point, we're going to move on to some more Big 12 and West Virginia stuff. But I find it interesting because you made the comment that if I get this right, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's, except for people watching their team, there's no big correlation between the other games that they watch. People watch the best games. Yeah. So the, the actually the number one, uh, and I'm, I'm still in some of the analysis on this. So I don't, I don't want to pour it in concrete yet because we're still sort of digging into it. Um, and like I said, I, I, my, my friend at Viacom was at the gym. I was trying to get some, some numbers actually that I could you guys hear with you guys uh, to make sure I just want to clear some stuff with him to make sure that I'm, giving and some of those numbers the exact stuff right uh, the number one thing that uh and again i've done all kinds of crazy like multi multi-factor regression stuff um to this um but the the number one um determinant of the number of people watching it is what channel it's on so there's a little bit of chicken or the egg and the, and the number two factor is appears to be um man play again i'm playing with the model so the, the final model might have a little difference but but the two big pieces are, is it an important game and what channel is it on? And then further down from that, way pretty far further down from that, is where the school itself is able to influence the, the viewing. And so uh, you know, Ohio State, right, there's some chicken or the egg. Because you know ABC is putting the Ohio State game on because Ohio State is Ohio State and they're really good and they have a you know, dominant team. So we're, we're, I'm playing with statistics models to try to pull out, for example, okay, you know, if Ohio, and you can't necessarily do this exactly, right, but you're in the formulas, you know, if Ohio State is 0-10, how many people watch the Ohio State game, hypothetically? You know, if the Ohio State is 0-10 and, and the Ohio State game is on the Big Ten network, how many people watch it? And uh, we've got, I've got some models that can probably come okay at, you know, sort of, sort of estimating that. Um, but you know, again, like I said, there's a little bit of chicken or the egg because the network is choosing the best game and putting that on, on there. Um, but the truth is that if you're a team and you're winning, um, and you matter and the network puts you on, um, that's the major determinant of how many people watch. Okay. We'll, we'll steer toward, uh, the big 12 and specifically West Virginia. Now right. I, I took it because I could, uh, bend your ear for, for uh, ever Tony on this. And then uh, I'll ask this initial question and then uh, Kuz can jump in with uh, what, what he's got for you. But we're looking at the conference um, totals right now and it, it all makes sense. The SEC and the big 10 make the most money by far uh, the big 10 or the SEC is going to expand on that. Uh, the, the big 10 has actually made slightly more money than the SEC the last couple of football seasons, but the SEC is now going to take off. You would think, uh, with the addition of Oklahoma and Texas. So what does this mean for West Virginia and the Big 12? We see where they're in fourth place, considerably behind the others, and then Oklahoma and Texas leave. They do add, you know, the four other schools, but Oklahoma and Texas leave. And, and actually, if you go down to the next, the ne I, was, I think there's two pages down or something, has the Big 12 sort of shows the waterfall <laughs> of the Big 12 changing. Um, you know, so the interesting thing that... Uh, John Wilner, who is the, the from San Jose Mercury News, who runs the Pac-12 hotline, who's like a guru of this stuff, um, said, actually, I, asked him, I sent him a question, actually, and he got and about something else. And it, he actually put it in his mailbag. I loved it. And it got um, published. Um, what, what he has said is that the big and, and I, I and I'm also I've gotten this validated by some other TV people. I'm trying to get a little better validated. Um, but what he has said is essentially that to the network to the networks um they're paying for those flagship games and those flagship teams um whoever they are you know to anybody watching i i'm sure your team whoever they are is a flagship team they're that's what everybody wants to see um <laughs> uh but those other teams that nobody wants to see that are not your team uh, <laughs> whoever you are uh they, what he says is that they're all just essentially inventory and so whether it's 
and I'm, I'm again, I, I only pick on schools that I love. So if it's Iowa at, um, or I, I don't know, I, Iowa at Nebraska, um, right now that's pretty much just kind of an inventory game. And it doesn't matter, quite honestly, whether that's Iowa, Nebraska, or, you know, if suddenly the Big Ten were to expand and add Eastern Michigan and Bowling Green, that it's, it's just more inventory. Uh, and the, the, analysis, the piece that John Wilner was using talking about was comparing um, Oregon State and like Washington State. Um, and when you look at that, for example, basically he was saying that the, the teams further down, if they're not one of those huge draws, then the difference between the crowds that they attract for themselves are just lost in the noise of how many people are watching the game anyway. Um, again, so I, we're te- I'm sort of still testing this to make sure that, that you know, the, number, the numbers come out to say this, but, you know, how many people, <laughs> whether there's like a Desperate Housewives episode or reunion or something, or, you know, Real Housewives of Birmingham, uh, w- opposite you would have more impact probably on your TV watching than whether it was Iowa or Illinois. So I'm told. <laughs> I've got I've got a couple things I want to chime in on. Um, great stuff, man. I love this stuff. I could talk about it for hours, but I want to go back to the TV. I want to go back to the TV uh, thing for a second. TV yeah. conversation because I, I did a video the other day about uh, TV viewership, and or it was partially about TV viewership, but. I threw some stats in that I got from an article in the Oklahoman. And I didn't include this in my video because it was kind of irrelevant to my video topic. But in that article, I think it was November the 17th, 2018. I think I've got the date right. West Virginia played Oklahoma State. Uh ABC, I think it was a 3.30 afternoon game, Eastern time. It was the most watched game in that time slot of the whole day. Over 4 million viewers for that game, believe it or not. I believe it. Uh, because, but here's why, and it, and it had some pretty stiff. Con- Notre Dame was playing at that in that time slot. Uh, USC and UCLA were both playing each other in that time slot. It was so a rivalry game. I hope that to God that no one watched that game. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I, I wasn't following those teams. I went to USC. Sorry for anybody who's watching. <laughs> I love my Trojans. Um, there was an SEC game on, but it was it was two lower tier teams at the time. I think it was Tennessee and Missouri, maybe. Mm-hmm. And then there was a, then there was a Big Ten game between Michigan and maybe like Illinois. I, I don't remember Indiana, something like that. But anyway, I was I couldn't believe it that it drew for me, and it was on ABC, which by the way had, gets the best ratings of all the networks, which I thought was. But anyway, um, over four million viewers for an Oklahoma State West Virginia game, which is you know I wouldn't have thought that would happen, but West Virginia was playing for a chance to go to the Big Twelve championship game. So that goes back to what you said earlier: the game meant something. So there were people outside of those fan bases watching it. Yeah, including like I mean, I'll tell you because the funny thing that I laugh at is the the people that have like like assaulted me on Twitter, like yelling at me about how many people watch games. Like they watch the games. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah. you're not fans of that team. You watch the games. Right. I, I watch Nick Saban. I am not a fan of Alabama. I have a lot of friends who went to Alabama, but you know, I I watch those games. So I'm like, hey guys, there's there's more of us that are all watching the game collectively than you know than the kind of half-ass friends who who aren't. Mm-hmm. But again, again, there is there's some chicken or the egg, right? Because um, if you didn't have a big, if people weren't going to watch you, then you you wouldn't be in the conference and you wouldn't be on the TV. So you know, there's there's no there's no answering it. You know, you can't just sort of like put a you know cre- cre- you know put a bunch of chemicals together and invent a new football team. And all of a sudden, you know, a zillion people want to watch them. Yeah. And the other thing I want to talk about, you mentioned the word inventory. Yeah. And that is, I've heard the Big 12, the new Big 12, talk about that a couple of times because I think that was one of their reasons for expanding because you're losing two flagship schools, two, two uh, banner-carrying schools, if you want to call them that, that, uh, you know, where all the revenue comes from pretty much for the conference. Um. So their way to defend that or, or fight against that is to try to bring in more teams to get more inventory because they know they're not going to match the, the viewing power of a Texas and Oklahoma. So you get more inventory now. And I'm even hearing rumors are talking about going to, to 14 teams, you know, bring, bring in Colorado State and San Diego State, Boise State, whatever. Um, 
maybe that's their strategy now. They realize they, that because they're looking at the same numbers you're looking at, right? Well, they were looking at way better numbers than I am because they have like the real stuff. Right, um, I, I, right. I get it, but I, my point is directionally though they're looking that that and even more. So they they see it. They're not stupid. They know what's what's coming. They know their TV viewership is going to drop dramatically. So they got to have more inventory, and they're also touting the time zone argument. But it, yeah, and it may not drop as dramatically as we think. Again, <coughs> to be honest. Um, so to anybody who's listening, inventory is kind of like a, a good business word, and also kind of like a mean dickish word, um, because what it is is just you know fill in the blank games. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what what can what what can we show on TV? I mean, I'll, I'll give you a great example. Um, you know, growing up, there were all those, you know, you guys who are old like me, remember those like Marshall Falk 54 to 48 games that would be on. It was like Pac-12 after dark before the Pac-12 had the after dark contract. Those old whack games, you know, that, I mean, that kind of stuff. You know, but you're going to watch it, whoever it is. You know, now we watch Pac-12 after dark of, you know, Washington State versus ASU. And you just you just sort of watch it. And you and quite honestly, you know, I hate to say this, but we'd watch it if it was whoever. Um and, and that's kind of like the thought of inventory. And so right. it, when a team, if you get a game that, you know, doesn't matter as much, you know, it's just sort of like to the, the, ra- the, the influence of that team's fan base is less relevant than the influence of uh, the importance of the game and the fact that people are watching it. Um, yeah. And you think about West Virginia, you know, one of the things I would say about West Virginia too, is that you guys play teams close Again, I'm not, I don't have TV internals data, but like, I would think that like, as you guys play teams close and beat Texas and stuff like that, people switch to games when it's a good game. Right. And I would think you guys attract viewers to that. I mean, you guys also, by the way, historically win a lot of football games. You guys matter in the national realm. And so, you know, to that end, it's zero surprise to me that your, that your games would have, you know, good viewership. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I was surprised. I couldn't believe that ABC, ESPN has the lowest ratings of any of the networks. At least to that I saw. Uh, ABC was one, Fox was two, and ESPN was three. They're also showing the most games, though. Yeah, and That's and, and ESPN's just showing them one after another, after another, after another. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're showing um, Thursday and Friday American Conference games, Sun Belt games. They're also showing Maction on Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah night right. at time so that makes, that, that makes if, sense. if somebody if somebody's asking for the slide deck you can I, it's on twitter you can just go grab it yeah um now, and i wasn't throwing shade at espn i was just bringing you know but looking at the numbers i have in front of me right now from that article i would have been mad about that a couple of years ago Justin, <laughs> but i'm not now <laughs> actually i'm not, I, a, I'm not I, a huge fan of espn any only reason i have them is because i have because i'm not missing my games but other than that i wouldn't even have them but anyway that's another conversation but uh, I hear yeah, it was uh, West Virginia's ratings are all over the place. Uh, when you look at uh, since we're on that topic, and this is a West Virginia channel, uh, ABC West Virginia was like seventh in the conference. But when you look at ESPN, they were third in the conference in ratings. So it was uh, actually actually you could say they were second because Texas Tech only played one game in a four year period. So and, and so you can't really use one game as an average. And it, and if they were playing Oklahoma or Texas in that game, then it's going to skew the numbers, right? Well, so. and the numbers that I'm, that I'm, I'm putting together, actually, again, like I said, they're not all the way done yet. Actually pull out and extrapolate, like they break the game apart. Mm-hmm. Um, based, again, you know, sort of using like big statistics, you know, stats formulas, like <laughs> putting my grad school to use. <laughs> um, but what, what I've been able to do is sort of say, okay, well, like X team and Y team, you know, using these different sort of calculations, it kind of estimates, and I think I have it up to like an R squared, which is sort of like the explanation piece of about like 87% of the viewership, which is mm-hmm. for data like this is like really crazy good. Uh, I mean, because you're not going to, you're never going to get it all, but right. um, it's, it's in the 80s, which is awesome. And so I can kind of estimate like how much comes from, say, West Virginia and how much comes from, say, Oklahoma State, um, and, and then re reestimate that. And mm-hmm. you could almost estimate, like, all right, what what if we had a Notre Dame Texas game? How many people would be watching that? So that's kind of cool, right? Yeah, that's that's I, this neat, this stuff is neat to me. And well, yeah, and I that, answer, that's going to be neat. Again, I'm, we're not quite done with it, but <laughs> right. um, it's going to be awesome. I want to answer one of these comments. No one on Twitter will believe it, though. It's fine. Somebody said, uh, 
because West Virginia never plays on ESPN, and I have the data right here, they have played more games on ESPN than any team in the Big 12 in the past four year seasons. Is that so, ESPN or any of the ESPN? I think I think it combines ESPN and ESPN okay. Plus. I believe. Uh, I mean, I mean not Plus, but two ESPN and ESPN two. I think, Mark. Okay. Just curious. And, uh, Chris, I, if you want to, if if you, like, if you want to do a show on it or sometime or something, we can yeah. dig into like pull like just the what once I get that all done, we can pull like just the West Virginia data. Like, yeah. Look at it and stuff too, because there's. But cool, I mean, West, cool West Virginia games are on TV a lot. I mean, they're, yeah, they're all on TV. Um. They they've played four. They only played four on Fox, but Fox has got a contract with another conference, if I'm not mistaken, right? And then Pac-12, uh, Big Ten. Yeah, so they played and they played nine on ESPN. They've played seven on ABC. So I mean, uh, I'll take it. <clears throat> hey Tony, um, I could explain. I know what I'm looking at here, but you will do such a better job explaining the expansion and realignment of the Big 12 and what that means and what we're looking at right now, if you can see it. Yeah. So this is this is a waterfall chart I put together. This is this is this. My, my friend was like, "Oh, you are a consultant." <laughs> when he saw this, it was really funny because people that I work with loves to put these together. What this does is it really shows the ups and downs of the impact. Of, of the Big 12s, people that have lost, uh, like teams that they've lost and teams that they've gained. So if you kind of look at it, it's the time series going from 2010 to, you know, about 2025 or whenever Texas takes off. Um, and so, it, you know, from 2010 to 2020, the Big 12 lost two teams. They lost Nebraska and Colorado, um, who both had pretty solid fan bases. In fact, I and it, this is all using current numbers because it would be, it'd be silly to try to like go and re backdate that and reimagine it and add the growth and all that. So these are just looking at current numbers. So these are kind of like the, what if the, what if then, what if now, what if the future? Um, but looking and, and, you know, the numbers aren't that different. If we, it would be a stupid exercise to make that change, but somebody will complain that I didn't. Um, but lo- looking at the old big 12, the old Big 12, because particularly with Texas and Oklahoma being huge institutions, huge fan bases, and Nebraska, you know, who's just like West Virginia, whole mm-hmm. state of Nebraska loves their team. Um, you know, the Big 12 took some dips. Uh, you know, they lost Nebraska, lost Colorado, lost AM, lost Missouri, picked up West Virginia. Uh, you know, I mean, West, West Virginia basically made up, just about made up for Nebraska. West Virginia and TCU together made up for Nebraska. Um, and, and that got them where they, where they kind of are now to about 20 million. Um, downside of that is almost 8 million to that is Texas and 3 million to that is Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. So now they've made that up a little bit with adding, you know, BYU a million, a million, a million's good, by the way. Um, you know, adding UCF, uh, adding Houston, adding Cincinnati. Now, again, we talk about TV numbers, you know, people know BYU is a good team. A lot of people watch BYU games that aren't necessarily BYU fans. So, you know, again, when you think about like TV inventory, you know, you're adding teams here that the people will watch. Um, the, the other thing that I think is interesting, which, which you really is really hard to measure in, you know, t- kind of anything with fans is the idea that people cheer for multiple teams. You know, I mean, I cheer for, I cheer for USC, I cheer for Michigan state, I cheer for Michigan, I cheer for Penn. Um, I even cheer sometimes for other teams, um, you know, but, but TCU, interestingly, Gary Patterson talked about how, when he was trying to build up the program and build up donors and build up a fan base and build up people to go to the games, he said a lot of the people that were, were donating and were supporting them and, you know, sort of joining their TCU community were Texas people or A&M people. And they were like, all right, well, you live in, we don't, we don't want to take that away from you, but you live here in Dallas, Fort Worth. So, you know, come and hang out with us, love us, be part of us. And, you know, we promise you can still love your real team. And, right. and that's a good chunk of how, Sunbelt is doing that in a big way right now, trying to, uh, and, you know, that's kind of a, a way that they, that they really built that up. Um, but, you know, kind of looking at this, you, you see that just, there's going to be, I, I think, I think the, the loss of Texas and Oklahoma will be very strongly felt in the big 12, mm-hmm. but you know, there's an element of, and you know, we could, I think they're going to write business school case studies about this because I think the big 12 is actually going to be a lot stronger. Um, you guys have seen Kuz and I walked through those heat maps, uh, of the, of the big 12 and Texas, 
like Texas just doesn't fit with the other schools in the big 12 very well, to be totally honest. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why they've never gotten along with them. Um, and so when you think about that, um, uh, I think the big 12 is going to be stronger. I mean, I think the, the, the attitude of the new teams coming in, um, uh, I think it's going to be a fun league. It's going to be like a league with like fun rivalries. Like I, th I think it's actually going to be, I think you guys are going to, especially West Virginia fans. I mean, you guys are going to be on top of the heap as well. JT Daniels, you're going to really be on top of the heap. You guys may be playing for their championship this year. Uh, you know, the, it's going to be a, a, I think a much stronger conference. I agree. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited about it, honestly. So, Tony, what I'm seeing here with the Big 12 expansion as well is that despite losing 55 to 60 percent of the fan base, Houston and UCF intrigue me. Cincinnati, to a certain degree, Cincinnati's the best football team on the field right now uh, and has been for the last three or four years. But Houston and UCF, not huge fan bases based on this information, but Houston produces more NFL players than any metro area in the nation and is just a recruiting hotbed beyond belief and ucf is right there disney orlando the state of florida and and putting some of your other metrics into play that now if they connect with larger more established more recognized football brands on the field that they're playing i think they have they, i think they zoom up um because again also remember we're taking this is data that's averaged over the course of a decade Yep. So, you know, UCF in 2011 was nothing. I mean, USF was, the, I think, the team back then anyway in that area. Um, Cincinnati was really nothing. Um, that, was a da that was a down point for Houston. President Couture was just, I think she took over in 2008. And so she was like just starting to ramp them up. And so, you know, th those teams are, it's quite honestly, in these numbers, those teams are carrying the sandbags. We, we wanted to average because averaging gives us the best answer. But, you know, you sort of just, you know, put an asterisk on that, that if your team is one that is sandbagged by the fact that you were, you know, bad in the beginning of the time, or using my wonderful own alma mater, you were good at the beginning and sucked at the end. Um, you know, you just sort of know that, okay, our, our numbers are going to be artificially off. And if we win, they go up. The other big thing is the, what I think, and I'm, I'm trying to get some data on this to sort of show this, it's hard to sort of show with numbers, but I've got enough that I very much feel I can say this. Um, the, the thing that really drives, I think, fan bases more than anything is winning and attention. So I think when you win and you get attention, you just absolutely you know, garner more people. And, and you, win, you win and get attention on TV. So you know, I think these teams playing on TV in front of everybody is going to make all of the difference. Playing good teams in front of everybody and, and competing and winning um, you're going to probably see, you know, I, I, I bet if I were to redo these numbers in three years, you'd see UCF, Houston, and Cincinnati sitting there um, equal to everybody else in the Big 12. Just my prediction. Tony Altimore, we appreciate you being here. Strategist, consultant. Uh, it's just fascinating to get your take on college football and what it all means. And <laughs> like Koo said several times, we could sit here for 10 hours and just get started on. I, I just want to uh, know where the country roads are. <laughs> We're here with West Virginia. There's no country that's, roads. I'm so sad. That's Koo's <laughs> department. I can't, if I I'll play it, I, I tried to play it on a video once and they nailed me for copyright. So sorry. Oh, about actually, that that's, you're right. That's, I didn't even think about that with you. Jeez, man. All and, right. And no, the, you know, actually, I'm, the, if we that, say that it, was, it was copyright before the video was even published, man. It's crazy. That's oh, it is okay, amazing. You're right. You're right. I take that back. No, no country roads. I once had a window open on my laptop that I didn't even think was being detected and I, I couldn't even hear it and wow. it played a commercial and boom, they nailed it at 20 minutes and seven seconds into your video for three seconds. You played this commercial, boom, no monetization for that video. Yeah. Right. I'm not hurting anybody's monetization on this. This is fun guys. Yeah. I, uh, I love it. Tony, thank you so much for that. We appreciate it. Uh, you are welcome back anytime. You can uh, bet that I'll be tracking you down for more uh, insight into all of this. We'd love to help. And, and, and by the way, to, to the fans out there, thank you to everybody that's like reached out on Twitter and emailed and everything like that. I really appreciate it. Um, and you know, again, to everybody, your, your team is certainly number one in, in, in everyone's heart, I'm sure. Um, and, and, and treat, treat everything kind of relatively and just as, as a data point and, 
uh, know that as you win, I'm sure your team's numbers will, will go way up. And I'm praying to God mine does as well. <laughs> you see Tony's Twitter handle right there. So you can follow him right there at TJ Altimore. Uh, Tony, thanks again so much. Uh, have Bye a great on, Tim. We'll catch you soon. Take care, guys. Good stuff, Justin. Oh, yeah. Me and Tony did a video together, and he and I were talked before the show started. I, we, I bet we talked for two hours before I ever hit the record button. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's awesome. So everybody head on over to Coos's Corner and check out uh, Justin's video with uh, Tony as well as uh, I got to tell you, Justin, you produce a video every so often. And I'm not and I don't say this. I don't know how this comes across, but I just think because of my basic interests and because I just am so um, drop down my head and plow straight forward with what I'm doing is I take in very little content of anybody else's. I just don't even know what other people are doing out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I see you post on our college football page that you've been gracious enough to invite me to on Facebook. And I, every time you drop a video, I'll think that's a great idea. <laughs> that's a great topic. Well, I should have thought of that. <laughs> I try to come up with stuff that I, I mean, obviously there are sometimes you want to do this. If there's a really hot story, you want to do a video on it. But at times also you, I try to do something that nobody else is talking about. Yeah, and you I'm do to you accomplish that for sure. Yeah. Because I got to say, again, every time I see you, I'm like, man, why didn't I think of that? That's a great <laughs> topic. I'm not going to do you. it now, but because you killed it. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm not going to get after that. But uh, that it's phenomenal. You come up with some tremendous topics. There's no question about that. Um, folks, uh, we've got a West Virginia channel. And YouTube starts to take these things seriously when you get to a thousand subs. So... Uh, we are asking, even if you're not a West Virginia fan, if you're a West Virginia fan, it goes without saying, please subscribe. You get an uh, analysis and insight from Coos, from Travis Kenobi, from Golden Blue Dude, of course, and then all these other guests that we've had on throughout the weeks. And then I even have something to say about West Virginia football once in a while myself. And uh, you get all of that at the West Virginia channel. So please subscribe and I've got such an amazing viewership here in regards to people subscribing to channels that they don't even like. So thank you for doing that. And if you could do it one more time, and I'll ask you for another one, I'm sure. But one more time with this West Virginia channel, even if you don't like West Virginia football, please get us to a thousand, thousand subs. Once we get past that, you can unsubscribe and let it loose. But get us to a thousand subs. We would appreciate that. Yep. It doesn't take but a second and it's free. Absolutely. And again, Coos's Corner, subscribe to his work there right here on YouTube as well. Uh, Justin, it's been fun. Appreciate you being here. Yes, sir. And uh, we will catch you soon. Thanks for having me on, Mark. Thanks, everybody, for hopping on here. Good night. I, I have got another show scheduled at 9 p.m., so I'm going to uh -oh. turn this thing around as fast as I possibly can. I'll be right back here uh, talking about the toughest schedules in college football with all of you. We'll see you.